Okay, we're back again. Uh, we're talking about the divine artist who was able to go on a journey, uh, a pilgrimage, uh, in which he was able to meet all 250 members of the Glass Bead Game. Um, this is the second video, and we're on to number 23, and that is Immanuel Kant. And uh, what's most interesting uh, that I know about Immanuel Kant is uh, the Four Antimities, in which he uh, came up with, he argued both sides of an argument of four very important topics. And uh, uh, both sides of these arguments were so convincing that it was determined, or in his mind, was determined logically that there's no answer to these questions. And this leads it to the bigger uh, view that there is no ultimate truth to the entire universe. And I'm not sure if he completely believed that or not, but and I may be just adding that, uh, but that there is this ultimate paradox built in to the, um, the world and reality that we're perceiving. And these antimities are um, whether... Um, whether there was a beginning to time or if time has been eternal. And then uh, another one was space. If space goes on forever or if at some point uh, it stops, if it's discrete. Uh, another one was, is there a, a discrete uh, most fundamental unit to the universe? Is there some fundamental smallest unit to the universe, uh, some atomic uh, unit, uh, unit, or is there no foundation to the entire universe and state of being? Um, he also said uh, God exists as an absolute necessary being, uh, kind of like the um, George Berkeley said, who says that uh, uh, God always has to be there. Uh, the universe has to always be perceived in the mind of God. So it's eternal. It's uh, forever existing. Or uh, does God not exist? Um, and he argues that side of it as well. And uh, you may get into the argument, well, if there's an all-perfect God, why would he create a universe with evil and suffering in it? Um, so... Um, does God exist or does God not exist? And then uh, there were four antimonies, and I can't remember if I mentioned them all or if I missed one, uh, but that was the most important uh, thing that, uh, in my mind, he came up with in his critique. And I've only read Critique of Pure Reason, which is a very difficult read, a very thorough analysis of subject and object and reality and how we perceive and that there's this transcendent thing in itself um, uh, beyond our limited conception. Uh, the 24th um, ranked member in the glass bead game uh, that the divine artist was able to meet is Euclid. And uh, Euclid was very important in the, well, mathematical history, certainly. Um, uh, he developed all of his... Uh, axioms in uh, in his book of elements, the elements, uh, that's kind of the foundation of mathematics today. And um, the most interesting thing about Euclid, and this was really expanded on in the first book I wrote, The Metaphysics of Being, is the very first axiom is a, po a definition of a point is that which has no extension. So a point is uh, the foundation of everything. And this leads to an incredible paradox that um, something without extension, a nothing, is the foundation of all of the somethings. For example, lines are made up of points. And um, so the question is, how does something become a something if its foundation is a nothing? In this... Uh, is an extreme paradox and has not been resolved uh, to this day. And uh, just this definition of a point is that which has no extension. 
Uh, number 25 is George Cantor, and uh, he studied infinity, and uh, I did a video on him, and uh, um, what's interesting is he came up with this idea that some infinities are larger than others. If you picture a number line, and you had the real numbers, countable numbers, one, two, three, four, and that goes on to infinity. Well, in between those numbers are all the fractions of uh, one fourth, one half, one eighth, and an infinite amount of fractions within an infinite set of countable numbers. Well, what's interesting is the infinite set within the infinite set is so large that it makes the initial infinite set, the accountable numbers, approach a limit in zero, uh, of zero in, uh, in significance. Uh, because there's so many fractions, an infinitely more amount of fractions than there are of the countable numbers, that the set of these fractions, um, uh, the infinite set of these fractions is so large that the other infinite set uh, approaches a limit of zero in significance. Yeah, that is just uh, really amazing. Uh, number 26, Douglas Hofstetter wrote Gödel Escher Bach and currently is a professor in Indiana University and studying a lot about um, uh, towards artificial intelligence and um, the mind and consciousness. And in his book, Gödel Escher Bach and ultimately uh, I am a strange loop. Uh, one of the interesting things, well, not only did he kind of took this idea of the glass bead game of merging uh, Godel, which was mathematics, Escher, which was art, and uh, Bach, which was music, and uh, merging all of these ideas together, uh, which is very similar to what the glass bead game is all about. Um, but also, he came up with this concept of... Uh, uh, the eternal I being a uh, self-creating loop uh, as opposed to something having a beginning and an end it's almost a, and being created by something transcendent uh, he came up with this idea of maybe it's a self-creating loop more like a circle and uh, that was just a real fascinating uh, thing uh, he also talked about this uh, Kurt Gödel came up with an incompleteness theorem, and um, that uh, any logical system uh, you could never uh, prove uh, the truth of any logical system from within the system itself. It had to be proven from without the system, and this almost supports this idea of a transcendent God that trans uh, has to. Uh, prove and uh, uh, support um, uh, the truth of any closed logical set or system. So that's kind of a paradox because on the one hand he talks about there being a self-creating loop of the self because uh, he expanded this idea not only to mathematics and logic but also to uh, all of being and the self. Uh, so that's just all very fascinating. Uh, the 27th ranked class beat game member is Roger Penrose and wrote a fantastic book uh, called The Emperor's New Mind and ultimately um, uh, teamed up with um, Stuart Hameroff uh, or at least Stuart Hameroff took his ideas and tried to are trying to create this movie called Mindville and uh, a lot of this, what this is about, is uh, almost like the quantum, quantum mind, um, or applying quantum mechanics to the entirety of the universe. And uh, so he, his stuff is very hard to read, uh, but he's extremely respected in the uh, world of quantum mechanics and science, and is still alive today. Uh, number twenty-eight is Beethoven. I listen to Beethoven uh, almost daily 
Um, as I drive to or from work, I listen to um, uh, the symphony on Sirius Radio in my Mercedes S550, which I absolutely love. And um, uh, Beethoven, um, uh, part of one of his symphonies uh, uh, was the song, or part of the song, Ode to Joy, which he took from um, Frederick Schiller's poem, Ode to Joy. So he kind of tied these things together, and that kind of goes along with the glass bead game. And uh, Beethoven, again, uh, lost his hearing, or virtually lost his hearing, at the end of his life, but it didn't stop him from uh, composing because there's a mathematical nature to uh, music, and he was still able to compose even after he couldn't hear. Um, there's still this... Uh, mathematical uh, wave-like uh, vibration uh, to music and uh, he was able to in a sense feel uh, the music. Number 29 is Max Planck probably isn't known by that many people um, in 1900 proved that the reality that we are perceiving is discrete. There was always this argument of whether uh, something was continuous our reality is continuous or discrete and it's actually discrete uh, this is proven that you have reality in discrete chunks like this reality one two three four and that's how we're perceiving this much like a um, movie uh, cinema uh, puts together a movie by putting together a series of still shots and then uh, by showing them very quickly that look gives the illusion of movement. Uh, this ties into um, uh, Zeno's arrow paradox. How can a moving object at any one point in time be still? So that's a play on words paradox. And our reality is a paradox because all of the units and all of our conceived perceptions are these um, uh, discrete units and this is proven scientifically uh, through the quantum wave collapse and uh, everything is discrete including light and uh, all of uh, the quantum world and all of our thoughts are really uh, concepts of uh, discrete thoughts and units and our reality is that way as well. Uh, Julian Barber expanded on this in, in the book, his book, The End of Time, that all of our reality may be just these eternal um, snapshots, still shots, and that we're perceiving these uh, in a sequence. Um, another thing that was interesting about Max Planck real quick is uh, he came up with this idea that in between uh, well, there's a something and there's a nothing and a something. There's something, uh, there's like this nothingness in between the discreteness, which is also a paradox. How does this get to that without passing in between there? There's this nothingness, like it flashes on here, here, flash on here, flash on there. Um, but also um, that uh, these waves of reality uh, travel in variables of H. And uh, he was able to um, determine that this was a constant, uh, this variable of H, uh, whether you had large magnitudes or small amplitudes of waves of reality, that they all travel in these variable units of H. And this is um, really interesting. The more you dig into this, uh, quantum mechanics and the double slit experiment and how we are perceiving reality that there's this haze of reality that we're, uh, uh, we're able to perceive uh, these are the allowable uh, units of reality that we're able to perceive and that below these units of reality a Planck unit which uh, Max Planck theorizes the smallest atomic universe of of the uh, of our reality our perceived reality 
that there's a nothingness below this, that space and time don't exist below that. So that's just mind-blowing, uh, amazing stuff. Uh, number 30 is Louis de Broglie, and he's moved up on the list significantly over the last uh, year and a half or so. And the reason why is um, he came up with the theory in 1924 of wave particle duality that um, there is this duality to existence uh, it is um, a particle discrete when it's observed by a mind and it's a uh, wave of potential uh, possibly even a continuous wave um, of potential and uh, when it's unperceived. So um, reality has this um, uh, discrete uh, nature to it, a discrete understandable reality to it, but also there's this infinite uh, wave-like potential to it that's uh, out there as it's unperceived. So um, that's really an amazing thing if you think about um, our existence having an infinite wave of potential to it unperceived and the question is do they have a, um, a re reality, a real reality to them as well as being an unperceived wave of potential or is it only this uh, perceived discrete reality that is the real reality. <laughs> so all of that is amazing stuff. Uh, number 31 is Albert Einstein and the most amazing thing about him is this whole concept of the theory of relativity that everything is relative to something else and um, that even uh, motion uh, change cannot exist unless it's measured in a relationship to something else, a perceiver or other objects and uh, this is really an amazing thing as well um, it, that there's always a rate of change to something else so this um, really leads to this idea that there's no absolute nature to the universe because it's always relative to something else something's large or small or fast or slow relative to something else well if you're big to something small uh, you feel superior uh, if but then in reality there's an infinite amount of bigness <laughs> to other realities so then the insignificance of that um, so this uh, theory of relativity is absolutely amazing uh, given that and uh, when you tie it into this relationship of rate of change and uh, uh, that everything is relative to everything else and tied to everything else in the universe and then also how we linked uh, space and time uh, things get uh, heavier and shorter the faster they move especially as they approach like the speed of light and uh, I theorized if you could travel at, as fast as a um, photon which he proved was the speed limit of the universe uh, that time would stand still, which is also a par paradox, and that you would um, have infinite mass. So just all these paradoxes of the theory of relativity. Uh, number 32 is somebody that I've gotten to know recently, is a Russian composer, Alexander Scriben. Not many people would know him, but he's number 32 on the glass bead member list, and the divine artist was able to meet him in the uh, glass bead game. And what it is, is in um, 1903, he took three years to write a symphony called uh, The Divine Poem. And the purpose of The Divine Poem was that it would be pay played for uh, seven days uh, at the uh, top of the mountains in the Himalayas and that the um, the wave-like uh, symphony would emanate out into the universe 
to ultimately create a new universe without uh, evil and suffering in it. Well, he died unexpectedly at a very young age uh, in 1915, and he never made this trip to the Himalayas that he wanted to do. And um, during his life and afterwards, he was considered uh, insane uh, because he uh, viewed colors in relationships to each note uh, in his symphony. And uh, people thought he was uh, crazy, and he thought maybe like a, a D was red. And later it was scientifically proven that a D does have, and I'm just guessing which are which here, but uh, that a D does have the same wavelength as the color of red, and that uh, other notes have the same color, uh, wavelength as the color of green. So he was able to actually visualize this in his head and would see colors as uh, he would hear notes. So they just thought he was crazy. Um, he also viewed himself as like a godlike figure, uh, so he was shunned for that. I was able to see the Divine Poem with my son at the Chicago Symphony about two months ago. We went to see it. It was only the third time it had ever been played since 1920. It was played in 1920, 1979, and this year in 2013 uh, by the Chicago Symphony uh, were the only times the Divine Poem was played. And it was absolutely uh, chilling uh, and uh, moving piece, 55 minute piece, you know, very grandiose uh, with um, eight cellos, about 15 violas, and about 30 violins and a lot of other instruments. Instruments. There were about a hundred uh, total musicians. A uh, very grandiose is creating of the universe, and then it ended with two large harps playing and uh, a few um, flute players, and that was the end of the song in the creation of this new universe. Uh, so it was it was awesome. Um, moving on to number 33. Uh, Socrates and uh, Socrates was Plato's mentor and uh, Plato wrote about his uh, his death and um, Socrates was kind of this beatnik um, doing his own kind of thing philosopher that uh, um, believed in the perfect state of man and uh, Plato ultimately wrote about this in his theory of ideas that there's this per perfect uh, virtuous man that needs to exist well the state didn't like this because they viewed him as kind of a threat and you're not believing in our dogma so they really forced him to commit suicide by his drinking of hemlock uh, number 34 John Wheeler is a scientist quantum into quantum mechanics and uh, lived in the 1900s and one of his great lines was uh, law without law and um, he talked about in the perceived world there was this it from bit this discreteness of all the world that that we understand and there's laws uh, within our perceived universe, in our cause and effect universe that we perceive, um, but also that there may be almost this many worlds aspect to reality or existence, uh, and almost a law without law that in these other worlds, other laws may be may apply, and it may be completely different. So I thought that was fascinating about uh, John Wheeler. Number 35 is a guy that's really moved up in the glass bead game is uh, Lewis Carroll and uh, he did Alice in Wonderland and he actually Alice in Wonderland is this movie about an altered state of reality and this like perfect reality and uh, Lewis Carroll is actually uh, deeply philosophical in his writings and everything that he did um, in um, regards to reality and space and time and he uh, did a lot of his work I believe around 1890. 
Uh, the next one is Kurt Gödel. Um, he uh, came up with the incompleteness theorem, and uh, and what that is um, is that any closed system, uh, the proof of it could not uh, come about within the system. Something outside of the system had to prove the truth of a closed system. And uh, he, he came up with this around 1930, and he destroyed um, Albert North Whitehead's, Alfred Knight North Whitehead's, and Bertrand Russell's Principle Mathematica, which was going to be the foundation and all-encompassing truth about mathematics. And um, it came crashing down when Kurt Gödel came up with this incompleteness theorem, because at the very bottom, the very like first axiom could not be proven so that the foundation of the entire book of Principal Mathematica is on shaky ground and unprovable ground. And uh, people have later taken this to apply to uh, set theory and mathematics and also existence itself that is almost unprovable from with our closed limited system of uh, logic. So that's all real fascinating. And uh, uh, Kurt Gödel worked closely with uh, uh, Albert Einstein right up to his death into the 1950s, uh, working on space and time and uh, uh, trying to prove whether uh, backwards travel in time was possible and all kinds of unique things. And they ultimately failed. Um, number 37 is Vincent van Gogh, and he's another one that uh, I don't really appreciate his art that much, but he's very high on the Glass Bead Game member list because of this concept of he was too good for this world. And he ultimately committed suicide, uh, cut off his ear for his girlfriend to prove his love, uh, but this concept almost too good for this world is this idea of these glass bead game members are just so special uh, in the existence of, of uh, existence. If there's been 60 billion people that have ever existed, these 20, 250 people are so special and unique that they're almost too good for this world. Uh, next one is 38, Leonardo da Vinci. Again, um, a painter and artist uh, came up with the uh, idea of the perfect man, and uh, I think actually had a society uh, pursuing this uh, ideal perfect man. Again, this ties back to Socrates and Plato, this theory of the perfect man, and he, the one painting he did where the man is outstretched and it's a perfectly symmetrical. And that painting is actually the foundation of what Mr. Olympia is based uh, upon now, the current bodybuilders of a body and a being being in com a perfect uh, symmetrical form. Uh, 39, John Keogh, this is actually uh, somebody that's really jumped on the list recently. Uh, my son explained a lot more of his ideas. He came up with the Quantum Warrior and my aunt is actually on a 10 or 30 day uh, sabbatical with John Kehoe and they're uh, pursuing these higher states of consciousness and, and so forth. I think they're up in Canada right now. I don't know if she came back. Uh, she actually had me sign uh, the book I wrote, The Quantum, uh, The Journey to Qualia uh, to John Kehoe and she was going to give it to him. And it was just kind of a fun thing to do. Um, uh, but John Keogh has come up with this idea, again, of almost like this um, uh, future perfect man, pu future uh, state of consciousness of the quantum warrior uh, that uh, attaining almost a godlike state of a, of a human being. Uh, number 40 is uh, Charles Seif. Uh, he wrote the um, book Zero. 
uh, a biography of a dangerous idea and in that he talked a lot about how zero and infinity merged and that they're almost like twins and brothers and if you really dig into mathematics <laughs> uh, there's <coughs> there's a nothingness to infinity an inconceivable nothingness and it even on graphs some of the mathematical graphs uh, infinity goes out and kind of comes back through zero and it's uh, really an amazing thing that uh, probably a lot of mathematicians know and and understand and accept and uh, so that book was kind of one of the foundations too of uh, metaphysics of being the first book that I wrote so we'll stop here this is the second video of the divine artist all of the glass bead game members that uh, he was able to meet and we're up to number 40